Show me who you are. Fill me with your love and lead me to those who are around me. Those may not be the exact words, but amazing words. Once we see who Jesus is, once we understand his heart for people, we're much more willing to be led to those around us so we can share his love. Just speaking with some folks during the week and they were telling me how they had a, a holiday home and as they've moved there, that's been their experience. God has been leading them to the people around them. He's been connecting them by his spirit. They're seeing something in them. They're seeing the love of Jesus because they have the heartbeat of Jesus. They're gathering people. People want to know about the Lord. They want to know about his word. That can be all our experience. Once we catch a glimpse of who Jesus really is, once we catch a glimpse of his heartbeat and his heart for other people, we will automatically be led to people. We'll be open for that. We'll be willing to share our testimony and give voice to the hope that lies within us. So an amazing program during the week. Stephen Nolan and the search for faith. There's a man we need to pray for. Don't know if you've seen it, but it was so open. Wants to find God, but hasn't been able to find him. Father, we just pray that everyone that comes across his path will have a powerful testimony. Lord, they will be keys to unlock his heart. And as he genuinely seeks after you, Father, we thank you, your promises that he and many others like him will find you. Help us to be those laborers in the pathway. Help us to be those laborers in the field that can give our testimony, that can do our little bit to win people for you. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may take your seats. Let's show our appreciation to the team. Awesome. Once again. Okay, things are a little bit different today. Sunday school is going to go out with Mary and Kelly into the room beyond the off the foyer. So just watch out for Mary there. Grace is going out with the Sunday school teachers, helpers, and budding volunteers and arms twisted up their backs, coerced people that don't really want to do it but are afraid of grace. Uh, They're all going out because they're going to talk a little bit about the potential of uh, Sunday school and being a leader or seeing whether they want to be or not. And uh, yeah, everybody thinks grace is lovely, but grace is really scary. And uh, ask Andy. (laughs) And so... Uh, also, the baby room is in to my left and your right. If you have a baby needs fed, the TV is in there because they've stolen the TV out of the toddler's room for the kids today. So you'll have to make your own amusement or sneak a look into the baby room. So th- that's all there for your benefit. So please enjoy that. So if you're going out with Auntie Mary and Kelly, uh, if you're going out with Grace, you can leave the building now. Youth are staying, not leave the building, but leave this room. The youth are staying in today. Okay, great to see you all. You're very welcome. Again, you're welcome online. Connor uh, welcomed you all earlier. I'm going to start my timer. Uh, Remember this time. Let the mass exodus finish. Anyway, uh, we've been talking about being connected, and we've been talking about fivefold ministry, the importance of being connected to Jesus. So Jesus was an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, as well as Savior, healer, and everything that he is to us. And then we saw that when we give our lives to Jesus, we become connected to each other as the body of Christ. And so we all have a role to play. We're all ligaments. We are all people who supply each other spiritually. 
But it, it reminded me uh, a glow to the week before last. Jeanette was rind- reminding us of... Can- she was what? <laughs> rhyming. I was rhyming on a bit, but anyway. <laughs> she'll get over it. And uh, the, she was reminding us of the importance of connections. And even when you think of the pandemic, how connections, networks, people's relationships have been shut down because people have had to isolate and wear masks and all sorts of things. And so there's a lot of uh, depression. There's a lot of people feeling low because we're built for connection. And she had a ball of wool and she made us shout out, if you had two children and somebody else had two children, you shout at connect and passed the wool all around the place. The wool went everywhere and people were connecting. And then the group I was in, we were asked to write down an example uh, of our connections. Now, the average person, apparently, there's somebody called Robin Dunbar. He's a smart person anyway, but he worked out that the average person after doing surveys has 611 connections. That's a lot of connections, isn't it? I, when I looked at my phone contacts, I had 1,771, not counting my 15 email addresses. So I have a few more. But So some people will have thousands, some people will have a bit less. But he has worked out the average person has 611 connections. That's a lot of emotional time and energy if you were trying to get to know all those people in a very... Uh, getting to know them well, getting to build a relationship with them. It's not as simple as that. And so when we looked at the different, some of the different relationships that we all have, we wrote them on a page. We have some of us have spouses with fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, grandparents, grandchildren, uncles, aunts, cousins, friends, colleagues, mentors, mentees, coaches, pastors, teachers, students, disciples, people who are in interest groups with, uh, stamp collectors, flatly will get you everywhere, volunteer groups, pen pals, bosses, employees, lots of different things. All these people are in our network. These are all people we have connections with. Uh, These are all people that we rub shoulders with um, in day-to-day life. So we've looked at the spiritual side. We've looked at how, as the church, we're here to connect with each other, supply each other, help each other. But we have lots of connections with people who are not church And we need to know how to live out those as well. Sometimes we're so spiritually minded, we're no heavenly use. And so we need a space and a place for everyone. You cannot squeeze the the crowd into the space that somebody else should be. And those 1,600 or 611 connections that you have, you're not going to be able to have them all in the same space in your life. So there's a space and a place uh, for everyone. And so who better to find out how that works than look at Jesus' life? And so Jesus, he had the crowd in his life. Crowds followed him everywhere, as we'll see in a moment. He had the 70 that he sent out, those 70 disciples. He had the 12 apostles. He had the three within that group. And then he had one person that he had a very special relationship with. And so we're going to look and find out some principles and concepts today. Don't worry so much about the numbers. I say, well, I don't have 70 people in a particular group or 12. The 70 could be just a a handful. It's not about the numbers. These are the numbers Jesus had. It's about the principle and the concept behind it. Because if you let the wrong person into the wrong space, it will waste so much of your time and cause you so much heartache, as we'll see as we go through this. And so let's start with the crowd. The, everywhere Jesus went, the crowd followed him. Look, go on to the next little slide. There's the crowd. All sorts of people doing all sorts of things that we see from time to time. We maybe know them up the street. We maybe don't know their name. But the, there's crowds of people everywhere. Go down into Belfast on a Saturday afternoon, now that you're allowed to. Uh, even in Lisburn, occasionally there's crowds. Lisburn's a town that thinks it's a city. I suggested that one time at the council meeting when before Lisburn became a city, they were looking for strap lines for the city. And I said, well, what about the town that thinks it's a city? They didn't think that was a good idea for some reason. But anyway, so here's the crowd. Here's some scriptures about what the Bible says about the crowd. A massive crowd of people followed him everywhere. Imagine everywhere you went, a massive crowd of people following you. That would, that would be wearying, wouldn't it? 
It's a bit like some of our Fijian families here. They have a crowd before they have a crowd. I, I said to some, they have so many children. The, the, they're like the woman that lived in the shoe. But they tell me they've only three or four. But it seems more. Uh, maybe they're just noisy. <laughs> anyway, two was plenty for me. I said to Mary when we get married, I said, we're going to have two children. We'll have a boy first and we'll have a girl next and we'll have a gentleman's family, and you're going to have to have these children at times when I'm not working in the chip shop because I'm busy, and you're going to have to accommodate my work, which she did. And so she's a very obedient wife, and it worked out very well. Anyway, so a massive crowd of people followed him everywhere. They were attracted by his miracles and the healings they watched him perform. In John 6, we see Jesus talking about being the bread of life. We sung about him being the light of the world, but he's the bread of life. And he he had just fed the 5,000. And Jesus said to them, I have bread that you know not of. Uh, Brennan's, I think it was. And so, but look what it says. The crowd jumped at that. Master, give us this bread now and forever. They're thinking, happy days, free bread. Uh, We'll just, we'll keep with, we'll keep with Jesus here. The crowd didn't fully understand Jesus as we know now. They, they thought Jesus was there to overthrow the Romans because they, were, they, they understood the prophetic words that were in the Old Testament. Here's one of them, for instance, Jeremiah. Hear this, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. I will return them to the land that I gave to their forefathers and they will take possession of it. And so the crowd are saying, this is an amazing, this is the Messiah, yeah. He heals, he produces bread uh, and, and meals from loaves and fishes, but he's going to come, he's going to be the king, he's going to overthrow the Romans. That was their expectations. It was right through, even the disciples didn't fully understand. Look, the disciples said to him, so when they had come together, they asked him repeatedly. Imagine, you ever get that when somebody keep, a child keeps asking, are we there yet? Are we there yet? No, we're not even left the drive. And so we've all maybe had that experience if we're parents. And so here they are. uh, uh, They repeatedly ask him, are you at this time reestablishing the kingdom and restoring it to Israel? Are we there yet? Uh, And so Jesus didn't answer their question. But that was the expectation of the crowd. You see, the crowd have needs they want met. I need healed. I need bread. I need my son raised. All very legitimate needs, isn't that right? There's nothing wrong with any of those needs, but the crowd have needs they want met. The crowds are after the benefit of the connection. Being connected to Jesus brings tremendous benefits with it, doesn't it? The crowd have an agenda they hope uh, you will help them fulfill. So they were wanting Jesus to rise up and be the king that would overthrow the Romans. The crowd will drain you physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. If you let the wrong people into your life on a constant basis, you will be wearied. Here's an important, if you don't remember anything else I say today, remember this, the crowd needs to be managed. You know those people that ring you up and talk very nicely to you. They know your name. I don't know how they know your name, but they're trying to sell you gas, electric, double glazing, triple glazing, a better phone deal, a mobile phone. Do you know that copper wire is going to, I got one the other day, copper wire is going to be no longer, and somebody must have stole it. It's all going to be VoIP. Are you ready for that? I'm from such and such and such. I probably get three to four of those calls a day from the crowd, who I do not want to get calls from. If I was to take 10 minutes nicely explaining why I don't want VoIP or double glazing or a new mobile phone contract, and I get 20 of those a week, I worked out in a lifetime, I would have wasted a year and a half of my life. But some people, Christians are so nice with a certain explain. All you have to do is say, I did not ask for this call. Please take me off your list. Thank you. Put the phone down and then block that call from the next time. Does everybody do that? Mary's not here, so I can tell on her. We used to get these calls. Lindsay and I were sitting. So Mary would start this whole big 
Say, Mary, just put the phone down. We don't need double glazing. We don't need insurance. We don't need, I got one the other day about a funeral, my funeral costs. I could pay. Anyway, so the, I have discovered the easiest answer is, I did not ask for this call. It's unsolicited. Please take me off your list. Thank you. 30 seconds will do that. You will save a year and a half of your life by doing that because that's the crowd. Look what Jesus did. Jesus, hit in the midst of this story in Mark 6, the crowd were there. People had, they still had the same needs. They still need healed. They still needed all those things. He said to his disciples, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So Jesus and the disciple knew there were times they had to withdraw from the crowds. There's, I could give you 10 scriptures on this. Sometimes Jesus withdrew on his own. Sometimes he said to the disciples, it's time to rest. It's time to come away from the crowd. Sometimes they went in a boat into the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus had more concern for his disciples. This is interesting. If you're a boss, if you're a team leader in anything, you have to look after your staff. You have to look after your volunteers. It's one of our principles in the community projects that we do. Number one is our staff and our volunteers. Next are the clients. And so because those staff and volunteers are giving their lives away for those people. It's like the drowning man. If someone's drowning, they can't help someone else. And so we need those spaces. We need those times set aside. So we need to manage the crowd, whether it's the person on the phone trying to sell you something you don't want, or whether it's a legitimate area of people where you just minister into, you need to have those green spaces that you come away from. That makes sense? And so Jesus gives us precedent for it because sometimes we feel guilty by taking a day off or half a day off. I know I do, and I've had to try and teach myself and learn from these principles. Then there was the 70. The 70, we find them in Luke 10, if you go on to the next one. Uh, Luke 10, he sent out 70. Uh, here's what it says. The Lord Jesus formed 35 teams among the other disciples. Uh, each team was two disciples, 70 in all. He commissioned them to go ahead of him into every town he was about to visit. He released them with these instructions. Pray for more laborers to be sent into the harvest. Do not carry any purse or bag or sandals. In other words, an extra pair. It's okay to wear the ones on your feet, but you don't need extra sandals. Do not salute anyone on the road. It uh, means don't greet anyone on the road. I just found out that that's a bit rude. We're supposed to be. You know, we think, oh, well, I, think I heard Mary saying to uh, Jordan, she saw her in Tesco's, but she was on a mission. She wasn't greeting anybody on the road. And so when we're on a mission, sometimes we don't have to get t time and to get into a whole lot of big conversations. That's quite an interesting one. Do not salute anyone on the road. Say peace to any house you entered. Remain in the same house. Do not go from house to house. Eat and drink whatever's provided. Don't complain is the, is the thought behind that. Heal the sick. These were just the messengers. These were just the people going out preparing the way for Jesus. Heal the sick. Tell the people that the kingdom of God has come near. Wipe the dust of your feet against people if, if you don't receive you. So, you know, so Jesus can be firm. And so here's the 70. What's, what's the 70 about? They were on a mission. They were sent out on a mission. They had a corporate plan and a job description. That's just what I've read to you. And that's all straight from the scriptures. That a corporate plan, this is what you're to do. This is where you're to go. This is where you're going to stay. This is what you're to eat. This is what you're to do if you're not received. You're not to greet anybody in the way. This was their plan and their job description. They were preparing the ground. They were part of a bigger plan that Jesus had. They are Jesus' ministry colleagues. There's a good word. They're colleagues. They're helping him and helping us fulfill our ministry. They may be the people you work with. They may be the people you teach with. They may be the people you're in a team, some sort of a team with, the Cubs, the Scouts, the GB. These are people who are colleagues. They're not particularly your friends. You're friendly with them. You know them. 
but they're colleagues. You're on a mission. You're trying to fulfill something. You have a plan. You have a purpose. You're trying to help people, but you have a, a job description. You have a, a corporate plan of how you're going to do it. Those people, when you go to work, you generally leave those people at work and you come home. If you're working from home now, that's a different story again. But, but you understand those are colleagues. They're in that colleague space. And so Jesus understood where they were. They were helping him fulfill his mission. But then he had the 12. You see, this group's getting smaller. and sm Everybody's part of the crowd but then they get smaller and smaller. Some of these people may have been part of the crowd originally, and then they come into that inner circle. And so the 12, the 12 are the disciples. Somebody done this. This is like the wee friends thing, isn't it? So the disciples were his friends in a sense. Uh, and so here's what it says about the 12 uh, in Mark 3. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to himself, you see, the other people were corporate people. They were called to the big plan. They were called to the vision. They were called to what was happening. But before the disciples, and the disciples were called to that, obviously. But look what it says. He called them to himself. This was a relationship thing. This was not a corporate thing. This was about relationship. He called them to himself. The man he wanted to be his close companions. See the difference? One were colleagues, these were companions. That's a whole different level, isn't it, of understanding uh, of relationship. And so whom he could send out to preach with power to drive out evil spirits, these were the 12 he appointed, and, and we know who they are without, without reading them all out. One of them actually was a, was a traitor. One of them betrayed him. And so, and Jesus knew that was going to happen. And so that's a whole other sermon that Jesus even had someone in his group so to help us understand how, you see, this wasn't an enemy. This was a companion. And so maybe you today have had a companion, somebody who you thought was your friend, and maybe they betrayed you. Maybe you let them down. Well, Jesus had it. You see, Jesus had the same issues. And so therefore, look how he dealt with it. He got on with the job. He forgave. At the end of the day, Judas did what he did. But Jesus knew that was going to happen. You could have people. You may have had people. You maybe will have people in the future who you think are companions. And maybe they're going to let you down. Don't let it derail you. Don't let it put you off course. Don't let it take you away from the plan and purpose that God has for you. And so these were his close companions. You see, the 12, he called them to himself. They were handpicked. See, the crowd's not handpicked. The 70 were handpicked, but these people are people that you choose to be in your life. These are people that you choose to be your friends, your companions, the people that you're going to do life with, maybe is a, is a way to put it. These are people who are going to be around you, support you, you support them. Their companions. They had a mentor mentee relationship. So they were learning from Jesus all the time. And then he was, he was preparing them. Uh, they were a purpose led, as I've written here. They were a purpose led connection. There was purpose behind their connection. They were companions, there was friends, but there was a much bigger picture. Jesus is building his succession plan around them. Because Jesus knows in three short years, he's going to be with the Father, and these guys are going to have to pick up the slack. Now, when you read about them, they're a rum bunch, aren't they? They're the sons of thunder, and the ones that put their foot in their mouth, and all, they're just like us. And, and so, <laughs> here's a speak for yourself. And uh, But he had to input into them. That's why he had to call them into himself. He didn't say like the 70, here's a corporate plan. Do this, 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 and this. He had to tell, show, and do. They were a different uh, breed apart in a sense. They were his companions. He, he demonstrated. He, he brought them along with him, and then he let them do it. And then he, he, he prepared them for succession. And so those people were his companions. Then there's a three. It's a little next video slide. Happy Friendship Day. Some people say two's company, three's a crowd, but 
out of that 12, Jesus had three that he poured more into. They were the three, the 12. Yes, they were part of the 12, but the three, these men were present with Jesus during special events. For instance, they, they were eyewitnesses of, of Jesus' transfiguration. Jesus said to Peter, James, and John, who were the three, in case you weren't aware of that, he said, come up the mountain. We're going to spend some time together. And when they were there, Moses and Elijah appeared, and Jesus then shone. It was as if the, the light that was in him was so bright, it was as if he became translucent. Uh, and it was a transfiguration. And so they were blown away by this. Peter, James, and John said, well, let's build some memorial stones here. We can't wait to get down the mountain to tell everybody. But Jesus said, no, don't, don't, don't tell anybody. They witnessed Jesus raise uh, Jairus' daughter from the dead, one of Jesus' uh, early miracles. He put everybody else out. He brought Peter, James, and John in along with, with Jairus. Uh, and that, that just the family, close family, and then he raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. They, they experienced things that some of the other apostles and disciples didn't experience. He asked them to accompany him when he prayed in the garden, Matthew 26. It was Peter, James, and John. He said, come, pray with me. Spend an hour praying for me. Support me at this time. This is the, the darkest hour or one of the darkest hours of my life to this point. Of course, they fell asleep. But he, those were the three that he brought. Sometimes we think, oh, they were all there. No, he brought those three. They witnessed Jesus' greatest moments of glory and his darkest trials. They were his close friends. And hopefully we all have two or three close friends. Uh, again, the statistics would tell you, you know, people have 10 million followers on Facebook and no friends. You ever meet those people? Billy, no mates. So oh, I have 10,000 followers on Facebook but couldn't speak to you in real life. What's that all about? Anyway, don't start being that one. But very few people have more than one, two, three friends because you have companions, the, the circle gets wider, but... When you have two or three friends like that, it's something very special. So they were his close friends. The three, they shared special moments with Jesus. You know, can you think of your friends? You think of the special moments you shared with them when you get together. You think, remember that time we did such and such? Remember the time? Yeah, I remember there was two or three of us ran about together. And maybe we would decide, you know, there's a lovely place in Dublin does liver and onions. And we would drive to Dublin to this restaurant that was down steps. And it could be 8 o'clock at night, we'd decide to go, or 7 o'clock at night. We'd drive to Dublin, have liver and onions, and then drive home again. Just for the crack. You know, we all do those sorts of things when we're younger, maybe, and older. Uh, and so we reminisce. We have those special memories together, those special moments together. They shared special moments with Jesus. There's, a wee, there's where we a bit more up market, raising the dead, the transfiguration, and being with them in the Garden of Gethsemane. We maybe didn't experience those. But they were with them in good and bad times. True friends are with us in good and bad times. They had revelation and insight that the others didn't. Jesus said, don't tell them. Here's another important issue. It's like the crowd. You have to manage the crowd you don't have to tell everybody your secrets. I've had to learn this. I just tell everybody everything. People don't need to know all my business. Lindsay will say, Dad, you don't, have to give, you don't need to give an explanation for that. You don't have to tell. Jesus said, don't tell them. Think, well, Jesus, that's not fair. You're creating a click here. You're creating a click with James and John and Peter. And what about the other nine? Well, Jesus had his reasons, and sometimes there are things that you don't tell. That sometimes there are things, there are secrets, they're just for that small band of people that are in that space. That three space may have two in it, or it may have four in it, but remember, it's the concept we're talking about. There's some things that you can share with them that you're not going to share with your wider group of companions because sometimes you share stuff with people and it will get you in trouble because maybe they let it slip or they tell a secret or they say something that they shouldn't have said. But the problem is you shouldn't have told them. 
And so uh, we have a saying in Northern Ireland, don't tell that person they couldn't hold their own water, which is a disgusting statement, but it's, a, it's, a, it's very uh, explanatory, isn't it? <laughs> and so if you think someone can't hold their own water, don't be telling them your closest secrets. Uh, and so even Jesus did that. So there, here's a precedent here. We can say, oh, don't feel guilty if you think, no, I actually can't or shouldn't be sharing that with that person. Maybe there's a reason that you shouldn't be. And so Jesus said, don't tell them. No, they, they couldn't wait to get down the mountain to tell. Jesus said, no, this is just between us for whatever reason it was. And, and it was, I suppose, because they were his key generals. They were the people that he was going to build his ministry on, along with the others. But they were key, key friends, key players, key generals in the building of the church. They were his confidants. They were the people that he shared, he journeyed, he traveled with in an, in an intimate way. Then there's the one. The one's important. If you're married, uh, hopefully it's your husband or your wife. We should be able to confide. We should be able to share our secrets and our hearts with our spouse. That's why God has given them to us. Uh, but sometimes we can have a friend outside of that that is, is in the one space and that's okay. If we're not married, hopefully we have, we have a person that, that is the one that we can share our heart with. Don't try to force it. You know, sometimes people think, oh, I need a friend or I need this or I need that. Then they become a stalker. That's not, that could be a, one of your contacts, but that's not going to achieve what you wanted to achieve but ask God, if, if you feel, I need a friend, I need a, conf I need a confident, I need a group of people, ask God to open the door. Ask him to create those circumstances. Don't try to force stuff because then you're trying to force someone into a space that they never were intended to be. And so it could be your best buddy. It could be your best mates. It's, I, lo I love watching the hairy bikers. It's a real bromance. And they're great mates, and, and uh, well, I think one of them is married, one of them is maybe divorced. But they're just like Darby and Joan, but they're the hairy bikers, if you ever watch them, they're great crack. And they're just out supporting each other. It's lovely to have a friend like that. And, and so uh, God will give us those people. And Jesus had one of those people in his group. Within that three, there was the one, and that was John. Now, I'm always tickled that it was John wrote this stuff because I would write that. If I had the book of Brian, the Gospel of Brian, I'd be writing, and Brian was the favorite disciple. <laughs> and, and so John 13, 23 says, the disciple that Jesus dearly loved was at the right hand of him at the table and was leaning his head on Jesus. This was at the, the Last Supper. And so that's how close John was. Speaking of John, doesn't mention his name here, but John was so close. He, uh, the, the King James said he had laid his head on his bosom. He was right at his head, at his heart, here in his heartbeat. And so Jesus was saying, one of you is going to betray me. He was telling what was going to happen. And he said, one of you, one of this 12, one of my companions here, you're going to betray me. So, of course, Peter Peter always wants to know what's going on, doesn't he? And as we do. Uh, and so Peter just gestured to the disciple to ask Jesus who he was referring to. Then the dearly loved disciple leaned into Jesus' chest and whispered, Master, who is it? And so Peter didn't want to say, go on, Jesus. Go on, go on, go on. Tell us who it was. He, not John, you, you're his mate. He'll tell you. And so uh, it's interesting to see the different levels of relationship there. We move on. Jesus is uh, he's, not, he's being crucified. He's on the cross. I always think this is amazing. Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Salome, Salome, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. This reminds me of our church. There's three Marys here. We have Mary Sherry, Mary Marnell, Mary Agnew. And maybe if there's any other Marys today, you're very welcome. But uh, this is a very scriptural church with three Marys. And, and so they're standing near the cross. 
Listen, Jesus in his pain and his agony, look what he says. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, in other words, John, he said to her, dear woman, here is your son. He said to his disciple, here is your mother. From then on, John took her into his home. Isn't that interesting? He is the one you see. You see, the interesting thing is Jesus had loads of siblings. People maybe don't realize that. If you just go on to the next little slide. Don't know. Sometimes when you're watching online, sometimes the screen's on this side. Sometimes it's on that side. So I don't know whether to look this way or that way to make it look as if I know what I'm doing online. But anyway, see, Jim, Jesus' siblings could have looked after his mother. And maybe you were brought up in a, a tradition that told you that Jesus didn't have any brothers and sisters because of the, the theology of the Virgin Mary, etc. But Jesus had, had, the Bible tells us clearly, Jesus had brothers and sisters. Mark 6, uh, 3, uh, it says, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? Which would almost tell us that Joseph was dead at this stage in Jesus' life because he's not mentioned. Brother of James, because James has a book in the New Testament. He was a leader in the church at Jerusalem. Joseph and Judas and Simon are his sisters not with us. So the rack and Jesus had two sisters also. And they were deeply offended by him. Their disapproval blinded them to the fact that he was anointed by God as the Messiah. So they're saying, is this not, is this, not this is your man of the chip shop? What would he know about being a pastor? This is the guy that did such, this is the carpenter's son. What would he know about being the Messiah? And so they were blinded because of their prejudices. But this clearly tells us that there were six options that Jesus had. Jesus could have said on the cross, James is going to look after you. Joseph is going to look after you. Judas, Simon, the daughters, the daughters are going to look after you. Or you're going to share around one month, another month, another month. You'd only have to have her two times a year and that be handy. He didn't do any of that. Because of his relationship with John, he said, John, this is your mother. Mother, this is your son. He took that responsibility. Quite amazing. The one is a special person. If you have that friend, you have a special person in life. The one is close enough to know your heartbeat. You see, the one doesn't have to always be told. They know what you're thinking. If you're married any length of time, you know what your wife's thinking, unfortunately. Take the bins out. Sometimes you just have to look and you know. Uh, and so that's, that's the one. Sometimes if friends are like that, they just, they just know what the other person's thinking. So the one is close enough to know your heartbeat. They know things others don't. As we saw, Jesus said, the one that dips his bread in the wine, that's the one that's going to betray me. They're like a family member, as we see here. Jesus not only had him as, as a disciple, but he now made him his mother's son and responsible uh, for the family. They're like a family member. They carry responsibility and care for you and your family. Maybe many of you have had that. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you've lost a husband, a wife, a father, a mother. That one's the person wrapping your door, helping you get death certificates sorted out, getting the funeral arrangements sorted out. They're the person who's there for you. Wouldn't matter if you rung them at three in the morning and said, I need to go to Cork for a, an appointment. They say, that's okay, let me pull my clothes on. I'll be around in half an hour or whatever. And there would be a way. Those are special people. They carry responsibility and care for you and your family. They're beyond the confident, confidant level that the 12 and the, or so the three are at. They're the go-to confident. They're the person you go to when you're in trouble. You're the person you go to when you have something to rejoice about and be happy about. They're that person that you really do life with. There's my 35 minutes are up. So here's the question as we finish. Have you got the crowd? Maybe the band will come just as we're finishing off this last slide. Have you got the crowd, the 70, 
the 12, the 3, the 1 in the correct space and place in your life. Don't let the crowd waste your time. Manage the crowd. But understand the commitment that you have. If you're someone's one or they're your one, it's a place of commitment. It's a place you're the confident. You're the, the place of trust. Each level has, has different levels of responsibility, different levels of understanding. Don't worry so much about the numbers. Worry about the spaces and the concepts behind them. Fit the right people into the right spaces in your life and you will have a less stressful life. You'll have more time because you might be spending 10 minutes every day telling somebody why you don't want VoIP. Some of you are saying, I wish I'd have heard this sermon years ago because I start and explain to all these people, oh, I'm really sorry, I don't need this. Just say, I didn't ask for this call. Take me off your list. End of story. Hours, a year and a half, just think if you're young enough, an hour and a half, a year and a half, it could save of wasted time. Jesus wants us to have those relationships. You maybe don't have many of these or all of these. Ask the Holy Spirit to bring, draw those people around, around you. It's been difficult in the past year. Many people have been isolated alone, can't build on the relationships and friendships they have but just allow God allow the Holy Spirit to draw you to people and draw people to you don't force it don't become a stalker he has someone what does the Bible say he puts the solitary in families maybe someone in this church it may be someone in your circle that God wants to build those types of relationship with those types of connection thank you